reality. On a more optimistic future. Hi everyone, welcome to Cosmic. Human beings on planet Earth getting together to figure out what the hell is going on here. It feels like we are perpetuating extreme poverty and child labor with each cup of coffee that we drink. Well, guess what? That is actually true. Before the summer, in Cosmic 24, I talked to Kim Ossenblock, one of the best coffee experts in the world, and together we decided to launch a Cosmic series about coffee. Because, number one, we love coffee. Number two, more importantly, there are some urgent social and environmental issues to take care of. And the solutions are right here. Today, for the second episode of our coffee series, I am taking you to Brazil, to a coffee farm called FAF, Fazenda Ambiental Fortaleza, in the state of Sao Paulo. It means Environmental Fortress Farm in Portuguese. And this is where a family and the community around them are leading a revolution, making history in the sustainable coffee movement. They're driving change, showing that another model is possible. And that is possible right now. Beyond change making, shifting the paradigm, I told you, you're listening to Cosmic, and we're going to ask a few questions to Marcos Croce, the father as the FIF family. Hello, Marcos, how are you? Hey, how are you? What a, what a pleasure to be here and to share this. You know, thank you so much. And I'm looking at the background uh, landscape that you have on your webcam here, and it's, uh, it makes me feel like, oh, uh, I, I'm, I'm buying my tickets right now. It's a beautiful place that you're in, obviously. You should. You should, <laughs> you should come here and, uh, you know, everybody can come here. There's always uh, a little more space for nice people. Well, thank you. People <laughs> thank you so much. So tell me, um, you know, we have a lot to talk about, but I'd like to ask you first, um, what is so special about your work? for experts like Kim Block to send me to you for talking about the coffee revolution. Um, what do you think is special about your project? Project is, uh, is a dream uh, coming through. It's, uh, it's a work with many, many people, many families, many uh, from, from seat to cup, people involved in all the chain. And uh, it's 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 a reality happening. Uh, it's so nice that even people like you are found us and help us spread our message. Uh, so okay, special. Oh. Oh. coffee has brought us to a new level. Yes, it's time. It's time, and I'm I'm going to ask you if you can speak a little bit closer to the microphone. Um, into or a bit louder because um, I want to make sure we hear every single word uh, that you're going to t to uh, pronounce because it's going to be some precious uh, wisdom uh, here and I want to start by telling a little bit of the backstory the story of the family because the the farm is in the family since 1850 I think and in in 2001 if I'm correct your wife uh, Sylvia inherits from the farm and it was still a very traditional farm with, you know, 150 people uh, working in conventional uh, farming methods. And, uh, and I think at the time you were living in Chicago. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we took uh, 1991. We decided to move to Chicago, stay there a couple of years and come back so the kids would learn English. And I, you know, I was already, I always been in the import-export business. I want to export products from Brazil. And I, I just, you know, decided to take some sabbatical uh, at one point with the family. At the other point, uh, venture another, another place. So the main thing is that um, I went to the States, to be honest, for the American dream. Right. The After American a few dream. years there. Few years there, ten years down the road. I mean, I loved it. 
The kids now went to one of the, you know, the best schools in America, in the world, made fantastic friends. But I came back, I decided to return to Brazil. Well, because of the, the farm and also because of the American dream. It mm. was not, it was missing something. Right. Yeah, so I never thought I was going to be a farmer because I'm the beach guy. <laughs> and my wife had this, you know, nobody wanted the farm. It was this, this, you know, it was a 800-acre farm uh, with a lot of uh, um, problems. I mean, financial liability, workers' liability, environmental liability. It's something, you know, I... But two things I wanted to give to my kids. One was wings, the other roots. And that has been the family, has been the story, the history of Brazil. Uh, and so we decided to, and my wife said, you know, and I said, oh, why don't we keep the farm? She said, only if it's organic. I've been organic since you met me. I had the kids at home. I, uh, well, and she actually started beekeeping at first on the farm, that's how she became organic. And then she started in Highland Park, Illinois, where we live. And uh, she said, I've always been organic. I will not have a farm that's not organic. Right. And, but yourself, you're, you're not in the coffee business in Chicago. You're, you're in trade. Uh, what do you do at that time? Like, and and your, your wife, is she involved with coffee at that time? or? No, nobody was involved with, with coffee. I was involved in selling mostly Brazilian merchandise to the retailers in America. Mm -hmm. Mostly, mostly, I mean, mostly through the dollar stores. Yeah, uh, finding products that I could find for fifty cents and sell in a, in a in a dollar store. Then went to Walmart, and then the business became kind of rough because right everybody bought everybody and consolidation and. It was just doing nothing. I mean, it was feeling I was just doing, just trading, moving trash. Right. That was hard. <laughs> so, so you're still in in the you're you're in distribution, you're in trade, so you kind of know your your way around that that world. But big challenge, you decide to to take on the 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 farm, and um, you know, at that time, do, do you know that that you're going to make a revolution? Do we have this idea of like this, this ambition or was it first like, okay, we're going for, you know, 10 years of problem solving or how, what's the mindset at that moment? Well, I always, always wanted to do something with purpose. I could not just do something for just something. I mean, I have to mean something. So I was very unhappy. Uh, with my life there, with, uh, I mean, what, very happy in one way, uh, in a beautiful community with great friends and great schools, but people, you know, work for what they own and not for what they are. Mm -hmm. And I was invited to join the board of the Nature Conservancy of Illinois uh, a couple years before the farm came available. Mm -hmm. There was a big death. I mean, the farm was like a big death in the bank. It took 12 years to get out of there. You were my sun. You were my earth. But you didn't know all the ways I loved you. No. So you took a chance. Made of a plan. But I bet you didn't think that they would come crashing down. No. Say there's some things are better left un 
So you know, Marcos, I'm I'm really sorry because <laughs> I always have the best of Brazilian music somewhere on a playlist ready to go, and I play much Bra Brazilian music in in uh, on Cosmic. And just today we, we kind of improvised that that interview. Um, yeah, I didn't have that ready, so uh, I promise that I will compensate in the coming episodes with you know what is owed to Brazilian music culture. <laughs> So you take on the farm, and there's this debt, and uh, the condition is to, you know, move towards organic uh, production. And you mentioned that you gave um, shares to the employees right right away, or you, you, you changed the relationship with the employees of the farm. Can you tell me more about that? What was the problem, and what did you envision? Okay, now I arrive at the farm. I used to go on a farm just like once, twice a year, just to visit the family meetings, you know. But uh, now I, I am the farm, I have all these employees. I mean, the gap, the social gap is so big. Uh, people before never, you know, the owners didn't talk direct to the farm. They had one, you know, guy and he would, you know, be, you know, he'd never talk direct. I mean, it was very crazy. I mean, it was so difficult for me, even when, you know, before we, we took over. So, uh, actually, I call my brother, one of my brothers, that he's an environmentalist, and he's, you know, so, and I said, I'm living in the States, I can go, you know, I was coming, like the bubbly, but instead of once a year, once a month, I was still had to do my business there, and the farm had big problems. I was coming every month to the farm, and uh, the first meeting we invited the, the organic uh, uh, associations called IBD, uh, 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 Instituto Biodinamico, uh, we invited, my brother invited some people, we had a big talk with all the employees and we decided that we must change the name Fazenda Fortaleza, Fortress Farm, to Fazenda Ambiental Fortaleza, Environmental Fortress Farm, FAM, wow. where I now we are changing. And we invite everybody to change. Whoever wants to leave, we will pay five salaries. And so, because in Brazil, it's very hard to you know. People have been there for many years, several families there for, I mean, generations. Right. And I would pay five salaries and we help them. I mean, they could stay for, you know, six months if they need to find another place. And whoever wanted to stay, we want to change the relationship. We wanted them to be partners. Mm. The problem was, I mean, that well, it, it was it was a big education for me. I wanted to do things. I wanted really to do things. But uh, and then came this neighbor of mine. We call him Juan Loco, Crazy John. And Crazy John had used to do sixty five thousand bags of coffee and bankrupt a lot of people. Bankrupt. It was a big cross. Price went down. And everybody had a dip in, in the bank. It was, you know, our farm was one of the same thing. Uh, not that bad. But he was really bad. And, but then he started to observe that, um, uh, you know, as he abandoned the farm, he was living there, but not farming anymore. Right. And um, he was just seeing that some of the coffees that were in the shade were still, you know, flowering and bearing fruits. And the ones that was directly exposed to the sun. Uh, with no more inputs that uh, were dying. But the, it was a lot of change, and we together. And, and at that time, I decided to go to to uh, Central America to see shade grown farm because Brazil is all sun exposed. Big uh, uh, industrial in here. Nobody, you know, does that. So uh, I wanted to invite, uh, you know, people to look into that and to create something different because there was no chance to compete with the big guys. I mean, it was gigantic farms and uh, those guys control all the market, control the price. And if you, if you produce something to sell at a given price, a low price, you, you have, for you to have a margin, you yeah. have to take, you have to, you know, three issues. One, to make margin, you have to reduce people, mechanize. You have to take away from nature, 
Yeah. I mean, the more you take away, the cheaper it is. Mm -hmm. And you have to reduce quality. Right. So, I mean, the more, I mean, then that was nothing what I wanted to do. I mean, yeah, it's everything I mean, you didn't want to do. Yeah. Uh, and then I said, you're crazy. Well, first, I started to plant trees. So I plant trees like crazy because, uh, you know, I wanted the birds. <laughs> right. You know, I'm going to make a bird-friendly farm, the bubbling-friendly farm. And I, I was, and, and the neighbors had to say, either this guy is a madman or a communist or a visionary. Right. Well, today, everybody that has coffee around us, you know, work with us. But it was hard in the beginning. Uh, but with uh, João Neto, who was just walking the farm, and he said, you know what? The best manure to the farm is owner's footprints. So let's walk the farm. And you look for aptitudes. What are the aptitudes? What kind of trees? What do you have here? And instead of bringing something new, how can we make this place, uh, you know, using all the resources, I mean, the natural, uh, how to say, indigenous from here? Right. And that uh, was a big education. Yeah. So a lot, lot, of, lot of learning a lot of experimenting, I suppose. And in that phase, at the early stage, where is it that you were feeling the most resistance? Was it from the market or was it from getting the, the coffee quality that you wanted? Or was it from, um, you know, turning the, changing the culture of the workforce? All the above. All of the above. <laughs> All the above. I, I give a little bit more. But, uh, but then uh, Crazy John, you know, is just walking the farm and he said, let's look, let's just observe. And then, and I'm a businessman, I went to business school, I wanted to do things. And said, no, wait, you're going to observe. Mm -hmm. And when you have an obstacle, you, you know, you see a river, I want to go visit you on the other side. You don't jump in the water. You get a piece of leaf, through in the water, see the power of the water, land. Now you go up the, the, the margin and then jump in the water, enjoy your, your ride. Right. So that, you know, little things like that make me look into it. Another thing, it, whatever you do on a farm, whatever you do, takes 10 years. Unless you do annual crops and, you know, do crazy, you know, and then, but then you destroy everything. So... Uh, but uh, also the problem was the em employees. Yeah. Uh, the people, I mean, I want them to be partners. But I did not have know-how. The organic production, you know, when you just stop putting chemicals and the trees were, uh, um, the trees were used to that. And now you stop putting that. You did not know exactly. There was no know-how. Uh, mm. All the organic was small, very small farms. You, know, you got a bigger farm. Uh, so we lost 85% of our production in five years. 85? Uh, we did not have well, organic, in, and Felipe, my son, which is the coffee pro, and that's another thing. Uh, he, um, he got motivated to get into coffee. Uh, after 2008, we won a, uh, an award. One of the, I think it was the first farm to receive an uh, We did in Salva Negra did from uh, Nicaragua, but um, it was the first farm to get an, uh, a sustainable award. And we got, because of our social work, my wife was big in social work, and also become, you know, becoming organic and, and, and putting trees there. But the problem, and so Felipe decided to learn about coffee. He had a, a professor that was uh, in uh, Howard, uh, Howard in um, Caldis in uh, how to learn in, 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 Cald in Caldis in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was his professor and he went there and learned how to uh, cup and to roast and all the things. Then, um, so he started to guide me as far as quality. So we had a problem with quality. But organic, still today, it's changing very slowly. Organic still today uh, is a big challenge. And Felipe was invited to, to talk uh, Tim Wenderbo invited him to go to Norway to talk about four years ago. The challenges of organic uh, in Brazil. Hmm. The first challenge is no, is no know-how. I mean, 
who uh, uh, finance research in universities are the big multinationals. So right. School of Medicine, School of Agronomy, and School of Food Science. Right. I mean, are financed by those guys. And the doctors and agronomers, all those guys get out of school to sell drugs. That's right. what they learn. The better student, the worse it is. He's just doing everything right, going to the wrong way. So, so to, okay, that's the first challenge. There's nobody that knows her gang. I mean, you know, not especially coffee. There's nobody. It's, it's a happening now, but uh, when we're talking now, 2002, 2003. Mm. Uh, the, the talk was 2010, I think, 11. I don't know, 12. I don't know. The talk was much later. But um, the, the, the second, because there is no know how, there's no yield. There's year. no yields. Yeah. Yeah, because there's no know how. Today, right. uh, our yield is as good as, in some places, even better. As conventional. As con yeah, as, yeah, as conventional. Yeah, I mean, well, if you know what you do, if you have a, uh, uh, a happy plant, if you find the right house for the plant, every human being has to be in the right house. Uh, or, or people or animals or greens have to be the right house to be healthy and happy. So mm. if you find the house or create the house, uh, the plant is going to grow and it's going to be happy. It's going to bear fruits and it's going to be fantastic. So that's another. But so there was no know-how. So you, the third is cost. I mean, you don't put round up. You have to go and plant by plant and with your hand. You have you know, to have a lot of people just working on that. Uh, direct in the soil. Uh, the fourth is organic. Ask for uh, permaculture. Ask for diversity. So now you lose uh, quantity. You lose uh, right. Uh, you know scale. And right. then fifth, the worst. There's no market. People are not ready to buy. You know. Or the organic, they want to pay, and most women buy organic, okay? So they go in the market, and they don't want to pay more. I mean, it is, or just 5% more, they pay. The problem is, now, what they do, they mix all the bad stuff with the coffee. So most organic coffees are very bad. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very bad. I mean, it's organic, but organic. So then we were invited to go to Stockholm by the people from Johan Istrum for the Coffee Fest for four years in a row to talk about the difference between organic, quality, and sustainability.
You're listening to Cosmic today with the craziest of all the coffee farmers in the world. More questions to come, Marcos, get ready. Okay, so you're com confronted to all those uh, challenges and uh, decisions to make. Uh, there's no market. Uh, there's this uh, big challenge on the production front with moving to organic, uh, the quantity, the yields, the quality. And I'd like to ask you before we go further into the story, um, what are the assets that you have? Like, I mean, uh, the whether it's your mindset or your... I don't know. You're okay. You're you're a little bit crazy, maybe. Um, but there is something making you believe that this is going to work. Um, what are those assets that you have? Do you had? Uh, did you have a, a bit of financial uh, muscles to uh, palliate for that period? Or tell me more. All right. The farm came to us with a big debt. Right. There's no money yet. And uh, no. We did not have money. I had a little bit of my, you know, work uh, was making. I did not have a lot of money. Uh, it was just a dream because with the Nature Conservancy, I learned. I mean, I, as I told you, I was unhappy with the direction I was going, with, with, with what I was pursuing in life. For me, for my children, for my family. And uh, traveling with the Nature Conservancy with bird watchers, those guys were... Those guys travel 12 days in Brazil, 12 people, $1,000 a day. Man, $144,000. Let's plant tree and let's have birds at the farm. That's going to make us much more money than coffee. Right. So we decided, I mean, I was, you know, another thing that was important to me, it was traveling with them. I saw the importance of um, um, water basins. Oh. I mean, all the springs from one side of the mountain, they... I mean, you know, they end up going to the same creek, farming the same river. Mm. And I really, and, and I have this house on, on a place in an island in Brazil called Ilabela. On the back side of the island is a fisherman village. Uh, and water, when I was going, it's bring you health. But the way a lot of people coming, trashing water, uh, that's bring you disease. So I think, you know, I was this challenge of mine to working with water basins. When the farm came, my father-in-law had the vision to buy all the neighbors that had springs. We have 42 springs. Some of the springs, though, were, you know, you know, stepping by cattle and coffee around. So we first, we went and protected the springs. Protecting the There's springs, a, yeah. The Brazilian law is very good. They say you have to put at least 50 meters around every, and then in every single uh, waterway, should have 15 meters in each side. I just follow the law. The Brazilian law is good. It's just people don't follow. Right. And then I wanted to do also green corridors for wildlife. And so unite one, you know, corridor to other corridors. So, you know, so wildlife could come. Now, you you know, it was a big change now after almost 20 years. The, the animals, I mean, it's crazy how, you know, birds and a lot of, uh, not nomads, but, you know, there's a lot of now the what our wolf there there and uh, and you know little deers and all kinds of animals now. Even so, is it that you had this very strong uh, vision and conviction that if you uh, if you do the right thing in terms of protecting nature and like bringing being uh, bringing back as much habitat as possible, things are going to you know figure themselves out <laughs> like you had is it a kind of guiding light or what, what's the guiding light at that moment in the story yeah i think the important is to 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 do what you believe to do what you think is right mm. to live the moment to live i mean you know and 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 as i was going to the farm all every month and bringing all these people i started to learn we started to bring universities from the u.s to to visit because the first thing i did I was a lot, a lot of people left Oh, I, I have to tell you, go back a little bit. 
Yeah, please. My partners at the farm did not work out because, because we didn't have know-how, production went down, and all the partners left because they wanted to go back to conventional. And there was no way, according to my wife. And so it was, you know, we just lose the production and I lost all single partners in our land. Wow. So, but at that time, uh, Felipe graduated, spent six time at the farm. And when, after that, he went, he spent, I mean, he spent, he learned a lot about farming. And after that, he spent four years traveling around the world. Went to Tim Wendell, went to Johan Nistron, went to Seven Seeds in Melbourne, went to Clash in California, and started to meet all those, you know, top coffee guys. And when, uh, and he was coming back, I mean, travel comes back and everything. So he started to help us look into quality. Quality. Yeah. Uh, that was one thing. And then, uh, and I, I, at the same time, the water basin are on the mountains where the springs begin. And, and it was just, you know, in our, in our neighborhood, the property, human beings divide property by the water. My, my property goes into the river and you from the river on. My property goes to the top of the mountain, you go to the other side of the mountain. The two things that you have to protect the most belongs to nobody. Right. So then when we started the bubbling project, that was the idea. Instead of bringing employees, I will help those guys to go to the next level. They have to do different than the guys on the, where, you know, the mechanized area or the commodities or the big boys are. They have to do better. The problem is they don't have a market. Mm. So, uh, but they can do quality. And, and in the beginning, it was there some guys that helped me out. I mean, they were believing that I had Metropolis Coffee in, in Chicago was the place I would have coffee. There was just one of the beginners there. I had guys like Cafe Imports that, you know, you know, helped me in the beginning, helped a lot in the beginning. Uh, trust me. Uh, and when we started to do quality there, and uh, the problem is people would only want uh, good quality. If coffee is 87 and up, uh, you know, it was easy to sell. But most farmers do, if they're very good, they do 15%, 20% of coffee is very high quality. But then what you do with the rest? And what you do with 84, 85, which are good, excellent coffees? And, you know, and people were just selling to the commodity people at nothing. So we had to come up with something that used the bulk of the coffees, good coffee, of course, 84, 85s, and we started the Bubbling Project. Mm. The Bubbling Project is a group of farmers that share a common waterway, water uh, basin. Oh. The water, instead of divide us, the water put us together. We're united by the clean water. Clean oh. water for the coffee, Clean water for the neighbor and clean water for the grandchildren. They are neighbors working together. So then we started to go. Today, what we do is we have a common agronomist, a common soil specialist. You're part of something. You're not the top, you know, the top of everything. Now, human beings happened that became the main stewards of the planet. Right. And we need to be like a conductor on an orchestra the yeah. violin is not well you know everything is going to be bad so you should conduct and bring all life and bring, mix everything together a flower lady's daughter as sweet as holy water Said I'm a school reporter. Please teach me. I taught her two fingered Levite sister. Said peace. I stopped. I kissed her.
So, Marcos, what did you learn about the um, the management or the the uh, on, on the leadership front, and in terms of those human relations that your family has known how to cultivate? And um, you know, you completely shifted the paradigm of how those relationships uh, traditionally work in a in a society where you know we're building walls and and you know um caring about our territory and getting the water but we don't you know necessarily care about what the neighbor is getting and like you 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 live in another world and and you you manage to bring other people with you on that uh on that value system tell me about it okay well uh the first thing we had to do manage our family <laughs> manage the family itself can you come a bit closer to the microphone sorry manage the family yeah The, the, the first, I had to manage the family. I mean, Sylvia, uh, my wife, moved back to Brazil after my daughter went to college. That's 2010. And, and she is the farmer. I'm not a farmer. I was just there trying to uh, follow her lines of being organic. I need to figure out a way to uh, pay uh, for that farm. So I started to diversify. I fixed many houses. So we started to do hospitality, uh, all kinds of yoga and gastronomy and, and bring different farmers and universities because we were going towards sustainability. And right. I'm just put that. Uh, so I, I want to you know, say that about the mission, where we created a mission. Uh, our mission is our dream is to become a model of a sustainable farm, socially, environmentally, and economically, so that we can spread the sustainability seeds to the individual, to the family, to business, and to society. The individual has to be well physically, to be, to be well mentally, to be well spiritually, so they can see more than their own nose. They can look at the child, the bird, the tree. Thank you for, for sharing this. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the family has to be united because one is not well affected the whole. And the business needs to understand that they have to fulfill their mission without uh, compromising the next generations. So we started to bring people to the farm. The first part of the mission become a model of a, of a farm. Well, we're working on it. But the second part, uh, we, we spread the sustainability seeds. Yeah, because everybody goes there, start to see the progresses, see things, the progress in people, in soil, in plants, in animals. So that is already, that's a reality. Right. So what we, we decided then, when Siva came back, we, we got a, a two psychologists for a whole weekend. And we decided that each one of us should do something different. So Sylvia became the farmer. Uh, Felipe is the coffee quality. And I was, you know, uh, working outside the gate. Right. So that's what I knew how to do because I'm not the farmer. I love the farm, but I'm not the farmer. And she's really serious about spectrum in the organic She's a big, uh, you know, now we're becoming uh, 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 biodynamic. But so I started to try to work together with group of farmers with the same water. I did this before in my export business, is working together with farmers to make the uh, 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 same product, similar products of, or, or um, products that work together mm. to sell to the, to the big American market. Okay, so okay. I was already working together with groups of people. So you understand the value of collaboration. 
you've been cleaning your own house uh, in, in the family relationship uh, and, and, and everyone got a role and then you got out and you could start to, you know, uh, cross-pollinate that, that, that vision. It was very hard to have employees. Employees don't do the same. They don't have the same love. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So we empower the small farmers to be better in their farm. Sometimes, you know, uh, I mean, they are much higher on the mountain. They have their whole family working like crazy just to sell commodity. But they have a chance to do the quality that the big guys could not do. Now, Felipe is there. I mean, it's funny, you know, when when you are just you, you just you see a little bit and where everybody's blind, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, you can you can lead everybody, and yeah. and and everybody said you're crazy. You're gonna work with coffee. Everybody breaks. Everybody's bigger than you. I said, right. what an opportunity. Yeah, no difference. Yeah, and the so, only thing I learned on the <laughs> and so talking talking to those guys who are in conventional. Uh, Coffee farming. What do you think is is blocking? Uh, what do you think is blocking them from uh, following the same path? I mean, I understand that now um, a fast growing number of farmers are following that that path, and especially as now the specialty market is becoming um, uh, more and more. Um, well, uh, I wouldn't say mainstream, <laughs> but it's still it's growing. Um, what What do you think is blocking? Uh, farmers from stepping into that game uh, when you first um, present the, 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 the vision to them? Well, I did not present to the big guys. The big guys don't understand. I mean, right. and the big guys, oh, uh, it's, it's, it's controlled by just a very few uh, uh, traders. Right. And so those guys have no interest. And they're, they're not into quality. I mean, they are those guys are all finest, but they don't cup coffees. They only cup defects. I mean, they just come with me and, and, and they're just big trade and they, they work with very small margins, big quantities, and it's the exchange rate and the New York uh, coffee price. So there's nothing that can be done here from the production perspective. It has to come through regulation and, and investment decisions. Probably, yes. Okay. Or, I mean, I think... Uh, we're trying to, you know, I think the, everybody can help. Yeah. I think everybody can help because, let's say, our consumers are the young people. Are the the young people. Yeah. Old guys will not change. Okay. Okay, they're going to still drink that bitter, hot, uh, <laughs> sugar, whatever. I mean, it's, it's ash, uh, you know, like uh, coming to their right. body. Because I mean, well, with a cigarette. Yeah, yeah, I'd say it goes well. Yeah, see, so uh, so those guys would be hard to understand. I think, but the, the consumer is changing. The consumer is looking for something. Right. Um, but I'm going to go back to that. But before we go to that, because I want yeah. to tell about the consumer, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. our best partners. I will talk about how we got you know the other partners. So now I'm outside the farm. I go there and I need production because my production went down. I know how to sell. I have an advantage from all the farmers. I've been a trader. Right. I mean, a merchandise changer. I know I, I was living in the States. I, I, I know, you know, the, the logistics. Mm. And I know merchandising. And uh, so... Uh, that's where we're ahead. Now, what I need is it's, it's production, it's quantity. And, and, and I started to help those guys to go, you know, over and beyond what everybody's doing. Because I saw in, um, I saw in, in, um, in Central America, all those raised beds. I was uh, reading everybody about, you know, those African beds. And I was looking about just picking the, the, the you know, the right ones. Mm. And Felipe also started to travel and start to find. And we started to cup coffees and there were some excellent coffees. And some coffees said, Felipe, oh, this looks like an Ethiopian. This looks like a Kenyan. And it is so, you know, acidic and fruity. It's not the regular. So we started to, another thing, it's important to know. Brazil, the largest producer in the world. 
Only has Mundo Novo em Catuaí, right? Because IBC, Instituto Brasileiro do Café, was the only big uh, commercial. They, you have to sell to them, and they were the exporters. Right. And, right. and Brazilian is this agribusiness. Yeah. Those guys sit, and the president of uh, IBC, Instituto Brasileiro do Café, they will sit for 10, 12 years. They will direct the president of Brazil, used to be, they call the politics and coffee and milk, either from Sao Paulo or Minas Gerais, and they'll put those guys, and the guys stay for four years, the president, but the president, they had the money. Yeah. So they were only caring about quantity. Right. They were the only traders, and they created the Santos thing. It was just as, you know, a, a coffee was like a 1718 in sizes, and, they were, and then everything that was not good quality, and everything was, not, all the defects, and everything was going in the entire market. And then over-roasted. You know, that became the taste of Brazil. Right. Pretty much the taste of Italy, too, because they also buy cheap coffee. Mm. Good. Mm. The best machines in the world, and they, you know, still didn't figure out coffee. But <laughs> so, so, but now I see the world, especially the Scandinavian skin cares. The yeah. Scandinavians are, you know, really picky. And, they, and I'm, you know, I met those guys from Johan I met Tim Wendebo. Those guys came to, to PAF and started to, Cup those coffee with Felipe and and finding out and helping us the pro us the project from the beginning. I thank them a lot. Among yeah. others, I thank them a lot. And those guys were paying more more for quality. What do you think are the, the the what is the profile of farms that can follow your path? Because you're saying like the big guys, well, they care about volume and they care, you know. Um, and you know, regulation and investment um, policy is going to have to play a role there. But when you're going out and, and bringing, um, you know, leading other farms um, to to follow your path, what is the profile of that farm that can work with that model and move to specialty coffee and access those those growing markets? What's what's the profile? Well, the thing is. Uh You got a farm, a farmer. It's hard to make money on a farm. It's very hard. Those small guys, they have to put everybody to work, their kids, their wife, their mother-in-laws, and everybody to work, and don't, don't pay salary. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's one way. I mean, you go to a middle-sized farm, he has to have employees. And, he's, and when the coffee is nothing like now, I mean, you talk about 90 cents a pound. I mean, he, he, nobody can live on that. Only probably the big... Uh, They go with 20 caterpillars, round up, kill everything, no bees, not. Maybe they can do it, but those guys cannot do it. So money, money. I mean, they, they're afraid because, first, we don't have know-how. They look at my farm, the production is coming down. I want them to be organic. I cannot say that. But we can have a dream. We can plan for the future. We decided to, we're going to have a big party. And I want to invite all of you. To this party. You are part of the organization committee, you're going to help me invite everybody, and everybody is listening to this. It's going to be part. Let's do it. Because this party is going to be a hundred years from now, and everybody is going to participate. And when you know, because when you don't know where you're going, you go in circles, you create a hole. Yeah. When you know where you're going, Man, enjoy the ride. You can even go to the other way, but now you know that at the end, we're all going to meet at this party. <laughs> so it's you know it's it's now you have you have longevity, legacy, and purpose. Yeah. Now we, we're going to start. You yeah. know, every we only sell coffee for people to come to our farm. The roasters they want coffee. I would like to get your coffee. They would listen. Come here. Meet the producers. Meet. Right. Understand what we do. And then we can create something. We can inform more people because the millennials would pay. A dollar more in the cup if they know they knew of course where, where the coffee comes from yeah coffee is affordable coffee is, 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 is everybody can pay coffee so you can even pay you know a round for everybody and, and yeah actually drink a lot and drive coffee is fun yeah coffee is, is home outside home is 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 so what makes me good so um the 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 what what we started to do is tell to create price points, fixed price points. 
because the cost of production only goes up. Mm. I cannot oscillate. And then you, sometimes you sell at this price, now you sell to the half of the price, then you say, listen, I mean, how can you, you get desperate because you have to, you know, get literally get milk for your children and, and then you need to, uh, so everybody work with us. The bubbling coffee, which are main bigger coffee, which is our everyday coffee, it's a little off. It's 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 higher than commodity price, of course, but it's a price that has been fixed now. Yeah. For six, going to the seventh year, price that everybody knows, but price that can oscillate a little bit with the dollar fluctuation, but at least covers and motivates people to go to the right way. Yeah. yeah because. Yeah. Intelligence is very spread among cultures, races, sexes, whatever. Now, opportunity is not. When, when you know that you can have clean water, good water for your coffee, for your neighbor, and for your grandchildren, you yeah. are part of the solution. Because if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Yeah, that's true. So, I coffee for that. <laughs> yeah, it is. and it's it's evening time for me. I cannot drink coffee after three p.m. because then I I don't sleep. Um, but I have um, there's one last chapter that I wanted to touch on. Uh, if you um, if you agree, you know, we at Cosmic we're interested in in change, uh, but in particular, especially with the second season, I'm trying to really put the focus on paradigm shift and the people behind paradigm shift and what is special about that mindset and we're not going to get into you know psychotherapy or anything like this but uh, i'm interested to uh, to hear you on this because okay we heard that you know people see you as crazy that you've been taking uh, making all the decisions that from a business perspective are irrational and wrong um, but now, you know, success is starting to, to show off and everyone's talking about your coffee and, you know, the family is happy. You have, um, you know, it's, it's, it's looking really good and you're, you're really, um, a, a role model for, um, for many farmers and, and people in the coffee world. And you're planning this big party, uh, in a hundred years where everyone will want to, um, that everyone will want to attend. But what is wh like, what's in your mind when you wake up in the morning uh, or when you were waking up at that uh, time of transition and, and those conversations with your, with your wife, probably about, you know, just making all those crazy decisions. Like, where does that come from? You're talked about uh, spiritual life, about uh, physical shape, mental shape. But there's something, there's something more, or what? Were you always like this? Yeah. You ready for that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, my wife is the farmer. My son is the coffee guy. We have a group of kids working. They better than me on anything. I'm not a computer guy. I, am, I don't want to do all those things. I'm an office guy. So I was promoted to be the scout. The scout, yeah. So now I want to see what's next. What's the next wave? Mm -hmm. Because I went to Ber the Berlin show this year. And it was the best show in Europe. It was a fantastic show. And everybody now is third wave. Okay, I mean, some of those big guys, you know, they're talking third wave. So now I decided to stay two months after the Berlin show, beginning of June in Europe, to visit natural wine farms. I went to France and Aust Austria and to Greece and to uh, Italy and Spain, visiting what the natural wines were doing. It was incredible. I mean, listen, that's why we decided to become uh, biodynamic because we were staff, we were ready for biodynamic. We have the trees, we have the animals, we have the already organic, we have the mentality, but I mean, there's something else. There's something else that makes you feel good. It makes so and and as a you know uh, look out, I'm looking for the next waves. So we're at the seventh wave. I would like everybody to go to the seventh wave. So the first wave is to just give me coffee. I go to anyway and give me coffee. Second wave, the Starbucks, the environment, 
it's the home outside home thing. Coffee is still, you know, the third wave. Now I know my farm. I mean, at least I know my coffee. I know my coffee. I like the coffee that's more acidic, or I like my body, and I like more, more, you know, you know, whatever, more chocolate uh, and more floral. So I know my coffee. At different time of the day, I probably want the coffee. And the barista is teaching me about the coffees. So the fourth wave, which a lot of people are, the fourth wave. I know my farmer. I can Google my farmer. I can WhatsApp my farmer. I can talk to him. You you know the farmer is is, is organic or not, or his work or he's sustainable or not. You know if he's taking kids to school. You know now he has a veggie garden in his back home. He has a clean water. But yeah, <laughs> the the fifth wave. Yeah, is um, is now you're connected. You know your farmer. You you enjoy. So what you do, you can participate. Today, if you go on a Uber. You just uh, uh, at the end. You like your trip? Uh, you want to pay a, I mean, tip? You can tip the farmer, five percent, ten percent, fifty percent, a dollar. So now you can tip the farmer, mm-hmm. and now you participate. Now you feel it because now every uh, everybody's communicating, and I am now I'm part of the solution because I know my farmer, and it's just small thing, mm-hmm. and I'm learning and I'm feeling good. Yeah. Now you're ready for the sixth. Oh, you're what is feeling that? Feeling good. Feeling good. You're feeling good because now you participate. You drink a good cup of coffee, man. After this, what what is that feeling good? That sixth wave. I already feel good at uh, third wave, but uh, it's gonna it's gonna feel amazing. Now after that, you are now feeling good. I, I have over 500 uh, interviews. What do you feel when you drink coffee? Mm. Love, warmth, participation, uh, uh, I mean, satisfaction. Yeah, you don't feel guilt I mean, anymore. The sixth wave, the sixth wave is the sixth sense. Mm. Uh, you know, it's not more only the, the, the flavors of the coffee, it's what you feel. Mm. Now, because every second you lose in life, it's gone. So you gotta, through coffee, just learn that whatever you do, you better enjoy it because it's one ride and run one ride to the party to enjoy every second. <laughs> and now you're ready for the seventh wave. Wow. Are you ready? I'm ready. You surf the seventh wave because now the longer you're after taste, the longer you're gonna surf this wave. And we're all surfing, enjoying the ride to the party. And so wow. that, everybody that works with us now is preparing for the party. Everybody, every, every buyer that comes to the farm, uh, choose the coffee, choose the farmer, gets involved. They are participating now. We want the end consumer to participate, but we have the roasters. I mean, several of the roasters last year started to make donation of 2,000 euros, 5,000 euros, $1,000, doesn't matter whatever, you know, the size of the guy, you can help. Now we're creating water, um, uh, protects the, the springs, Pro, you know, I'll do all the waste system, uh, create uh, teachers for art, uh, do more raised beds. I mean, whatever, and you can suggest, plant more trees and give hope hope that we're gonna get all safe and enjoy this big party oh man and that's you know every day i wake up i feel good yeah. i'm riding the, the wave i think i that's go your to bed secret. riding the wave i think that's your secret because it's like really like when people you know look at all your crazy decisions they're like but he he's happy and your happiness is contagious And now your success is, you know, starting to <laughs> speak for itself. It's amazing. It's an amazing story. I will put the the links to the to the projects uh, in the episode notes. And 
you know, congratulations for all the work we are going to be following and maybe we can talk some other time soon uh, as we unfold the series. Maybe when you come to Barcelona, we have a round table with Kim and, and some coffee people. I love Barcelona. Can come anytime. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and congratulations and we will be following. Um, keep up the good work and best of luck. Well, listen, thank you so much. I love Barcelona. Thank you for all the coffee people. Great coffee scene in Barcelona. <laughs> you take care, everybody. To the party. See you. All right, to the party. Cheers. Thank you.